Thank you for, for the invitation. We've been saying we do this for some time. I, I did a schooling uh, maybe about two years ago. You may remember that one on Kautsky. Uh, that, was, that was from my bedroom at the time. So it's nice to be here in Amsterdam and see, uh, see comrades. Thank you for coming. Um, I will try and be 45 minutes. There's a lot of material to cover today. Um, but I've been working now for about the past year on, well, I've been working on Zetkin for actually quite some time, but specifically on a project for Die Gleichheit, which was Clara Zetkin's uh, newspaper founded in 1892. Uh, it's called the Newspaper for the Interests of Working Women. Um, and I'm looking at the period up until 1917 when she was removed by the SPD leadership as editor of that publication, uh, a bi-monthly publication for her opposition to the SPD's policies in the war. Um, so it's an ongoing project. One of the reasons why I'm here in Amsterdam for the next few days in the Institute for Soziale Geschiedenis, uh, <laughs> if I butchered the pronunciation, uh, and then uh, off to Berlin uh, next, next week for the, uh, the Bundesarchiv where all of her GDR papers are kept, but I'll talk about that later on. Um, I don't want to spend too much time today talking about Setkin and her life because I think that, that largely information that we can get elsewhere. However, again, feel free to heckle or ask any questions afterwards about her and what she did and where she was from and everything. Um, I'm happy to, to do that. I will take a, a, a quick look at that. But I thought um, in the interests of comradely discussion and debate, uh, I would actually focus on some of the more controversial and, uh, uh, aspects of her legacy and some of the ideas that I'm taking from it uh, today, which will hopefully uh, uh, provoke uh, and we can have a good, uh, good discussion about it. Um, I also want to talk about the problems when it comes to thinking about key figures or important uh, minds and, and activists of our movement historically. Uh, and the problems in approaching their legacy today, some of the issues involved with that, the fact that many of the things that we know about these, uh, these people have been filtered through a particular historical experience that comes down to us today, whether we're conscious of it or not. Uh, and that's particularly true of Clara Zetkin, who is perhaps one of the most controversial and disputed figures actually in the, in the history of our movement and in, indeed the history of the, 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 the movement for women's liberation. Okay, so that's a brief uh, thing. By the way, a lot of these slides you're seeing for the first time, they're fresh from across the road in the IASG. Uh, some, of these, uh, some of these images you can see. Um, and yeah, so th there's some, some lovely material there. Um, quickly on Setkin, these are kind of the, uh, what I want to do today, uh, go through uh, her, her life um, from her childhood through to her joining the, uh, the German social democracy. Um, uh, particular focus on her as the party soldier and the pioneer of the International Socialist Women's Movement, of which she was the, uh, the secretary, um, which also had uh, big roots in, in this country, uh, particularly through people like Helene Ankerschmidt, Ankerschmidt um, who was a very close comrade of, of Zetkin's, not just uh, in, in the early days, but throughout the First World War. Um, then I want to focus, uh, and I've got some new material for you here, which is an unknown... Uh, an unpublished, uh, previously untranslated, unpublished letter to Engels, Friedrich Engels, uh, by Zetkin in 1894, I believe. Uh, so you'll be seeing that for the first time, uh, you lucky, lucky people. Uh, and, um, so we'll look at that and how that relates to uh, the strategy of the ISWM, particularly the, the, uh, the, the I've just forgotten the Dutch word, the, the clean break, the Rheinische Scheidung uh, between the proletarian women's movement and the bourgeois uh, uh, women's movement, which is, I think, interesting and hopefully uh, uh, um, will provoke some discussion. And then have a look at some of her, uh, her later years as a communist MP uh, and, uh, uh, and then her experience uh, living and, and, and eventually dying in, in the Soviet Union. One of the things that annoys me about the, uh, the existing reception of Setkin insofar as it exists is that she is portrayed as a kind of... Um, uh, will will, the, will the, 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 this be a cultural reference as to English? A kind of pick and mix... Uh, you know when you get little, little, lots of different sweets in a bag, you know, and you pick them all together? She's kind of often portrayed in the literature as this kind of, she was an internationalist, she was a feminist, she was a pacifist, she was a socialist, she was a, a this and that. And I really want to challenge a lot of this framework today of kind of picking off her legacy into, into bits, but we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, 
just briefly on, the, uh, on her childhood, her socialization, as it were, um, the best book on this, on her, on her life, the best biography of Tsetkin is actually, uh, paradoxically, also the worst one. It's written by uh, Tanya Pushnagat. It's called Bürgerlichkeit und Marxismus, which I would translate as the uh, Marxism and the bourgeois mentality. It's anti-Marxist, it's anti-socialist, it's very critical of Tsetkin. But actually, the fact that it's critical of Tsetkin at all is a good thing because most of the literature that we get through is kind of hagiographic GDR type stuff uh, um, and, and fits into that mold. There's also the social democratic and feminist reception of Setkin, which I'll talk about and is also uh, problematic. Um, but yes, the, 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 the best book on, on this aspect of her life is, is Pushnagat. Protestant father, feminist mother. Her mother was heavily involved in kind of the, the, the post-1848, what Setkin would refer to as the bourgeois women's movement. Um, she was an incredibly talented woman who enjoyed the, the, uh, a kind of privileged education for the time. Most women could, couldn't actually get the kind of education that she had to become a teacher, uh, but she, she did so under the tutelage of a woman called August Schmidt, who was, a, again, a leading uh, uh, representative member of the, uh, the German women's movement at the time, the liberal German women's movement. Um, and basically... It was her environment, particularly in Leipzig, the cradle of the German workers' movement, where she comes into contact as a kind of an 18-year-old-ish, just finishing her, uh, her exams, uh, where she meets uh, people like Wilhelm Niebnecht, August Babel, uh, and, and comes into contact there through the, the so-called Leipzig uh, Bildungsvereine, so the, the Leipzig Workers' Educational Associations, right? She attends lectures by them, etc. And then um, in... She joins uh, the, the, the Socialist Workers' Party, as it was called, the, the Socialist Workers' Party of Germany uh, at the time in 1878, which, as some of you may know, is the exact time at which the party is banned under uh, Bismarck's anti-socialist laws. Um, and so she, she basically um, then helps out. She voluntarily goes into uh, uh, Swiss exile and works with uh, Julius Mottler and others in smuggling the Desultialdemokrat, the publication of the, uh, the, 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 the German Socialist Workers' Party, illegally from Switzerland into, into Germany. So she, she fills in for a guy who, uh, who couldn't do the work anymore. And then it's really through this process that she's then in, in contact. One of her major, major mentors is a guy you may have heard of called Edward Bernstein, uh, who at that point uh, his, is probably the, aside from Engels, the leading authority in the German language socialist movement in, in theoretical terms. He's the editor of the, of the newspaper, and he gives many a lecture on Marxist theory, etc. at this time uh, in which he partakes. Bernstein, uh, it must be said as well, uh, was in incredibly interested and active in uh, uh, the, 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 the development of a theory of uh, women's emancipation, uh, a, a Marxist theory of women's emancipation. Um, her influences, I think, maybe something I've come across a little bit, she, you know, Russian populism as well. She marries a, a Russian, uh, 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 Osip Tsetkin, who was a Russian exile living in, uh, in Germany at the time. Um, and, uh, and LaSalle, I think uh, one of my criticisms perhaps of Setkin, something I'm working on at the moment, is that there is a very strong, particularly in the later aspect, that's kind of the, the later years of her career, a very strong LaSallean trend within her writings and in her politics, which I'll just throw that out there for now. Maybe we can talk about that later. Um, da, da, da. Then she moves to, to France with so, uh, her husband, uh, her, her partner Osip Setkin is actually ex expelled from Germany as a result of taking part in a meeting addressed by August Babel, uh, a legal meeting that was held under the pretext of somebody's birthday party. Right? So they, uh, they have a birthday party, the police storm it, and he is, uh, is, is kicked out of the country as a dangerous uh, alien uh, revolutionary. Uh, so she joins him in France where she, so she, again, her ties to the socialist movement of the time are further increased. One of the uh, interesting things, she writes extensively on the history of the French movement at this time. So if any of you are interested in the history of French socialism, she's uh, written a lot of stuff, albeit in German, uh, on, on that for uh, Die Neue Zeit. And basically, this was a kind of time of uh, poverty, bohemia, uh, and a struggle to, ex to, to kind of keep the, pay the bills. Uh, but it's also the time in which she becomes connected to uh, the socialist movement, writing for Die Neue Zeit, translating articles, teaching, uh, uh, teaching languages, etc. Um, and here she she calls she joins a, the, the, an international circle, the Socialist International Circle, 
Circle International Socialist, again, my French is terrible, um, of various uh, groupings. And in that sense, she becomes instrumental to the founding of the Second International in 1889, where she's not only present as a delegate, but also helps with uh, uh, translating the documents, preparing the materials, etc., working closely uh, with people like Friedrich Engels on this. And it's in this, it's the founding congress of the Second International where she gives her first uh, a public speech to the to an international socialist audience, which is for the liberation of women, which is available uh, in translation in, in English. I think it's even on the Marxist Internet Archive, um, where you know, in the context of the time, she makes the case because many workers' associations at that time would see women as a challenge uh, to their uh, to their wealth, to their wages. Right? There was a kind of guild mentality that held that if women and children come into the workplace, as was happening en masse at that time, that will undercut the wages of the man, right? And st w w she and other people uh, p start to challenge this narrative and, as I say, develop uh, uh, the, the, the kind of Marxist politics of liberation, which we'll talk about in, uh, in a second. Um, here is the, uh, this is a book, I'm actually going to buy this when I go to Berlin. Uh, this is Die Gleichheit, uh, which is the, 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 the paper I'm working on now. As you can see, I was explaining to comrades earlier on, this is quite an enormous project because you can imagine there were two of these every month for 25 years, between eight and 16 pages. The writing is tiny, <laughs> German Fraktur. I worked out that if I went through every one, in, the, in its entirety, it would probably be about five to six million words uh, that I'd be having to work through, which may account for, partly may account for the fact that very few people have looked at this <laughs> newspaper, right? But it's, a, it's an omission, it's a very significant omission because, as we'll discuss in a second, when it comes to feminist writing, when it comes to social democratic writing, uh, when it comes to Stalinist writing on uh, the history of Marxism and, uh, and women's liberation, there's this huge gap here, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a significant gap when it comes to what was Die Gleichheit about? What was the International Socialist Women's Movement? What was it trying to do? What was its politics? What was it saying in these publications, right? Uh, and I think that's important. So yes, what I'm doing is incredibly new, fresh, original, and important. Um, but it's, yeah, it's also quite a lot of work. Um, and you see how the, uh, the, the, the magazine initially was kind of bankrolled um, by Devare Jakob, which was kind of the SPD's meme magazine. Uh, they've, kind of, they've, they've produced this uh, kind of uh, funny, funny magazine uh, with uh, political cartoons and sketches, and it was very popular. It sold incredibly wide, uh, widely. Uh, Dietz was the guy uh, who, who produced it, and uh, it, initially it was bankrolled. It, it made no money until about 1895, so the first, sorry, 1905, so the first 13 years or so of its existence, it was just sucking money, party money from, uh, from, the, from the other, other publications. But that's also true of Die Neue Zeit, for example, Kautsky's. Um, weekly uh, theoretic, theoretical journal. Um, it becomes the official p uh, paper then of the, the proletarian, uh, uh, the International Socialist Women's Movement. And you can see how across the, the, the period from 1902 to 1914, the, circ the circulation of the paper steadily grows. And in the, in the early days, um, there, were, there, was, there was quite a lot of criticism for um, it, not being, it being far too, far too theoretical, far too difficult to read uh, for most people. Uh, Babel, I think in, in the 1890s, says, you know, Clara's been kicking off again, but thankfully she's doing it in the pages of Die Gleichheit, which no one reads. <laughs> right? So he was, uh, there's that criticism in the, in the early days. But that's not true. As, uh, but with time, as the publication grows, it is uh, a, 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 an important uh, publication in its own right, in the sense that it's being read internationally, um, and it would be the, the kind of international organizer. So the Dutch women's movement would be writing in it, reporting in it, feeling back in it. The Russian women's movement, the Norwegian women's movement, you find all of these different uh, things feeding in. It's a theoretical magazine, but also has these, the, these um, rubrics like Austerbewegung, news from the movement, etc., right around uh, uh, Europe at least. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's, it is Clara Tedkin's uh, uh, testament. But it's not just important in that sense. It's also important as a uh, publication that speaks, that becomes an, an ever important voice of the revolutionary wing of social democracy. Even in the 1890s and the early 1900s, Tedkin is talking about two, the two souls of German social democracy, the two camps. 
right? The revolutionaries and the revisionists. And the Die Gleichheit in that sense, as some of you may already know, in the context of the First World War, it becomes a rallying point of opposition, right? For, against the politics, uh, the pro-war politics of social democracy on an international scale. So the first ever Congress of anti-war activists held during the war from both sides of the war is actually in the context of the Bern uh, Socialist Women's uh, Conference in March 1915, which is basically the work of Sedkin, Anka Smith, uh, uh, Krupskaya, Kollontai, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so it's, 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 it's important on a number of levels. There are key uh, themes and things to bring, bring out of it. And here the picture you see of uh, Für unsere Kinder, I'm sure as the, that's understandable for you, for our children, from 1905, partly in response to uh, some of the revisionist criticisms that the, 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 the journal was too demanding theoretically, but also in a way of, as a way of expanding the reach of the publication, there are uh, uh, bylag and supplements introduced uh, into the paper uh, for, for, our, for mothers and housewives and for our children. And they're basically uh, targeted um, at, uh, uh, at mothers and children in particular. And I actually went away, I don't know if any of you have seen this, I actually went away and translated or just provided the contents for, uh, for our children. And I made a joke, I mean, I teach German at university, right? And I made a joke that if you gave that to a, a, your average undergraduate student of German now in Britain, they would really struggle with the content. It actually shows, again, it's this, this kind of thing that's been lost in a sense. Um, uh, Tetkin makes the point once, uh, I think in the tw 1920s, that all classes have stopped reading. <laughs> right? And uh, but you see with this social democratic culture how demanding the culture was, how it was expected that you know, people would read a lot, they would discuss, and they, they, would, they would take these things seriously. So from my perspective in 2023, I'm like, Christ, this is a lot of stuff to read, right? Uh, but you know, the, the, the children's magazine would not be, you know, it would be Goethe, Schiller, Hölderlin, right? And these little poems and, and things, and all sorts of interesting things. And yeah, it's worth, uh, it's worth looking at more closely. I don't do that in my project necessarily. Uh, one of the other issues is that apart from these old GDR editions, that's, that's an actual a GDR public, uh, replication in the 70s or 80s, the, a lot of the original stuff has been lost, so it's hard to get hold of these supplements, unfortunately. Um, the whole uh, underpinning of this, of this endeavor is the clean break, the Rheinische Scheidung, um, between the bourgeois and proletarians. We're, we're going to talk about that in some detail now in a second. I want to focus more on that, I think, because it's something that's lost today, and I think it's worth highlighting. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll come on to that now in a, a second. Uh, yeah, this is, I, I should probably skip over this, but there's some nice, uh, um, there's some nice things here uh, about this is, this is how to raise your children. Uh, yeah, keep your word, be friendly to your children, become their friend, control yourself, be prepared to help, use your time wisely, decorate your house, look for the beautiful things, don't be a chatterbox, avoid alcohol, don't raise little hurrah patriots. <laughs> on, on, <laughs> honor the pioneers of our struggle. Don't put up with any showing off from your kids. Insist on good manners. Don't give long sermons. You shouldn't mollycoddle your kids. Go on walks with them. Familiarize your children with overcoming obstacles. Tell your kids the truth about sexual matters. Raise your children to be independent thinkers. Speak to your children. And there's this whole, there's, there's a kind of darker side to this as well, but in, in terms of the GDR uh, um, instrumentalization of Tetkin as some kind of Stalinist superwoman, right? Because she's portrayed as this, it also comes a little bit from her when she, in the letters when she says, oh, I have a working day of 23 hours a day. And then, I, and then I sleep for an hour and you think, no. Like, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not kind of, you know, I'm not kind of downplaying her commitment to the cause. She was incredibly hard working, often you know, raising kids, two kids she had at home, and then all the political work and everything else. But there is this, you know, again, often in letters. It's also a time when she's appealing to people like Axelrod and Kautsky and Plakhanov for money. You know, like, I'm really struggling here. I work 23... No one can work 23 hours a day. You, you'll die immediately. Not quite immediately, but... Uh, it's, uh, especially if you have kids. And um, so, so I think we have to be a little bit careful. But the way in which this is done is like, oh, in the GDR, people are complaining about... Women are complaining about the triple burden, right? So work... Childcare, party work, this is it's not just the the doppelte last, but the dreifache last. And they say, but look at Setkin, she did it, right? Uh, and so there is a certain problem looking at this stuff, but we, it, it's, it is remarkable to go back and look at this. I think this was probably the first ever socialist uh, uh, magazine for children aimed specifically at kids, right? Which is, which is a remarkable thing uh, in itself. And it, you know, it's good to see. 
uh, you know, 120 odd years later, the, what's insightful, what's progressive, what's kind of beyond its time, but also what's of its time as well, right? I think that's, the, that's something to, uh, to look at in more, uh, in more detail, even though I've just said I'm not going to look at it in more detail, but it's worth, uh, it's worth doing so. Okay, now we come on to Bravo Clara, which is a quote from, the, uh, uh, from Engels. And as I say, this is a, uh, an unpublished and untranslated, although I, am, uh, I, I was planning to do it for today, but I didn't quite get it done. It's quite a long letter from, uh, from Tsetkin uh, to Engels, I think in 1895. That's right, 1895. Now, here's where things start to hopefully, or maybe they won't be, get slightly more controversial, right? Because there's, again, Tsetkin is one of these figures who is kind of enshrouded in myth and instrumentalization. I've talked a little bit about the Stanless reception. Then we've got the left today, and how do we think about the politics of Clara Tsetkin? Uh, often people would talk of socialist feminism. So the kind of second wave feminist uh, uh, writing will look at Setkin's work and ideas and say, this is an example of socialist feminism. For me as a historian, that is in massively problematic. You can do, do you know this um, Google uh, uh, n-graph things where you can look at terms for historically? Type in uh, uh, feminism for Germany in the, in the period, in the Weimar period, uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in the Kaiserreich period through to the, uh, to, to the Second World War, but next to nothing. The term feminismus is really a product of the, second, the, the, the post-war environment, which you expect, right, the 60s, the 70s, etc. There are particular d terms in German that we should be careful when we're using. Uh, and again, maybe there's a crossover in Dutch. We could talk about that, about how these things work. But feminismus at that time is not a thing, let alone socialistische feminismus. It just doesn't exist. It's not in Setkin's writings. It's not in any of the other writings at the time. It's just not a thing. What, when they talk about people who argue for women's rights, these are Frauenrechtler or Frauenrechtlerinnen, depending on their gender, right? So that's, that's the way German works, women's rightists. Um, I'm sure this exists in Dutch as well, but just to make an, exp you can make in German an abstract noun from, uh, from somebody who does something by adding an EI. So Becker, the, the baker, the Beckerei is the bakery, right? And maybe this, this is a little bit similar in, in, in English as well. But there's also, in, a lo in, in, the, in the, uh, the language of German socialists at the time, the EI suffix uh, can also be add a kind of derogatory or uh, um, undermining way. Again, maybe there are examples in, 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 in Dutch. So when Kautsky, for example, criticizes uh, uh, the general strikists as you know, fetishizing the general strike, he will talk of general strikerei, right? <laughs> so you know, general stri general strikery would be a bad uh, 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 translation of it, but at least it imparts that sense of you know th this kind of messing around with the general strike as the be all and end all, right? Bernsteinlerei is this again something you get in the revisionist debate? That's uh, this in Rosa Luxemburg actually. The, again, this, the, and you read the English translations that it doesn't quite get it across. Setkin talks about Frauenrechtlerei, which I think the best way of translating to English would be those who are concerned solely and only or predominantly with the political equality of women, usually from the upper classes, to be equal with men in voting. That's a beautifully short, succinct translation, <laughs> uh, but it still doesn't quite get across the, uh, the way it works. Um, but why is this? And we, we, I spoke about uh, Tsetkin's socialization and mother being a, 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 a bourgeois feminist, as she would have, uh, uh, sorry, a bourgeois women's rightist. We do have to be careful with the words we use, a bourgeois women's rightist. Um, why is this? Tsetkin, from, from, from a very early stage, was convinced that the, uh, the, 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 the socialist women's movement had to have a distinct approach, a distinct st strategy, and a distinct or orientation, both theoretical and political, to the existing German women's movement, which predominantly involved the women of the upper classes trying, uh, uh, quite legitimately, to achieve uh, uh, things like the vote, equal status, and rights with men. Now, Tsetkin doesn't say, that's all nonsense. This isn't proletarian. We have nothing to do with that. She recognizes the absolute, she sort of said the, the, the historical significance of these things. But she says that the, the goals and the aims of these movements, as important and justified as they are, are not our aims and are not our movement. And that was the whole premise of things like Die Gleichheit and the Social Democratic uh, uh, magazine, uh, the Social Democratic Women's Movement. In 1894, the Bund Deutsche Frauen und Mädchenvereine, which is the Association of 
or the, the League of, of, of German Women's and, and, and Girls Associations, uh, they meet in Berlin to discuss uh, their, their politics and, and their orientation. And surprise, surprise, what do they say about the Social Democrats? They cannot <laughs> be allowed to join us. Social Democratic women's organizations cannot be allowed to join us. And if you think about it, it makes absolute sense, right? Because again, these, the, the, the Social Democratic Party is a revolutionary organization that's just come out of illegality, that is committed to overthrowing the existing order, right? And some people may sympathize with that, but they think, okay, this is good, but that is not their concern. As, as, as Tetkin says, these aims and our aims are different. Does that make sense? So she then, on the, the, the approach of that, and in response to the Austrian magazine, Der Kampf der Frau, The Struggle of Women, she uh, writes an article called Die Rheinische Scheidung, The Clean Break, um, and, she said, and basically in this article she kind of uh, uh, deals with, with, with these ideas and she quotes how at this conference it says uh, many of the people there are saying, oh, isn't it bad that the, intensif the intensification of the class struggle is detracting from or distracting from the, the goal of all women that they, all women have in common, the sisterhood, which is women's liberation. And second says, we are not going to shed any tears for the fact that the class struggle is intensifying. And she says, it is not the intensification of class struggle that blurs the coal common to all women, but the class differences that make such a goal a myth. So Setkin's approach is that, look, what is absolutely essential for the liberation of women is not, as she says, a struggle between men and women, as it were, in the name of a all uniting sisterhood. It's the struggle of the men and women of the working class to achieve the full emancipation of women, which isn't just to say, oh, the socialist revolution will wait till then, but to achieve uh, reforms and, and steps forward in the here and now. But it's a different approach, right? And that she uses this as an occasion to say, look, uh, this, not only are we saying this is important, but actually the, 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 the bourgeois women's movement itself is saying this is important because they have different approach. She calls them reactionaries, which then goes into a big to and fro with these Austrians. And she, you know, which said, are you saying we're all Christian conservatives or something? She says, no, you're reactionary because you stand on the basis, on the, the, on the foundation of the existing capitalist order. And we don't, right? And that's, uh, so that was, uh, that was an interesting one. Um, the, and, and it generally, in, 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 femini in the feminist reception of, uh, of Setkin, it, it, of, of all shades and varieties, she is seen as a dogmatist for this. Now, I would say there are some aspects of, of dogmatism in Setkin's view, but not this. I would actually say that actually, from our perspective, looking back today and looking forward, which I'll, I'll conclude at the, at the end with, um, we have to recognize that this was, not just in theoretical terms, but in practical terms, the contribution of Marxism to women's liberation, right? Not as a, not as a historical, that well done, good contribution, let's move on. Uh, but it, it, it's something that I think has been lost but precisely because of the defeats, the confusion, and everything that happened in the 20th century, which you know, we'll, we, can, we can discuss. Um, another quote here before we come on to Engers. The class-conscious proletariat cannot and must not tolerate the emergence of women's rightist views, again, Frauenrechtlerisch, yeah, to use the lovely German term, within its ranks that cloud and overrun the socialist point of view, or that the struggle between the sexes takes the place of the struggle between classes. I think I've explained that. In, uh, in 1895, there was a petition... Uh, <laughs> And Spengler, uh, Spengler uh, speaking of Spengler on Wednesday, sorry, Tekin, <laughs> talking about women's rights, also about Spengler. Um, <laughs> Tekin uh, uses this occasion. She says, look, three, three women basically have got together and they've gone to the Kaiser kind of on their knees to say, please, Kaiser, please give us the right to freedom and association under, under, your, existing, uh, 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 under your existing order. And... This causes quite a stink because Vorwärts, which is at that point, and Vorwärts is always the kind of central point of a struggle within the SPD. Between, it was largely, not always, but largely in the hands of the right wing of the party. And Setkin has all sorts of fights with the Vorwärts, often in the, the pages of Die Gleichheit. This is kind of her first one. And Vorwärts says, well, look, yeah, we can probably support this petition, actually. We can probably support it because, you know, we're also committed to the full political equality of, uh, of women, even in, within the framework of the Kaiserreich. I didn't really think that was possible, which was true, but you know, we, we, we fight for it at least. And Setkin says, no, this is absolute nonsense, right? Because, as she points out, 
these very same organizations, these very same women that, are, that go into the Kaiser with a petition are against freedom of association and an organization for the Social Democrats. So how can we, conf how can we, mix, how can we get mixed messages on this? Um, we need a clear approach. And actually, this is when she turns in, in this letter to Engels, which I will, uh, I will translate in full soon. She says, well, what do you think about this? I think that basically people accusing me here of being dogmatic, of making a song about nothing, making a, a big uh, fuss, fuss about nothing. And she, she, in a long letter, she basically outlines the fundamentals of her strategic approach uh, to Engels. Engels, I don't have the response to the letter. I'm not sure if there is a response. But the Bravo uh, Clara is in a letter to, I think, Victor Adler uh, at around the same period, which says, well, good on Clara Tsetkin for standing up against, clearly, uh, uh, tendencies to, uh, to kind of mix up these principles and blur things. And even August Babel uh, uh, was, was, was kind of more on board with the Forvet's approach. So I'm not saying, hey, you know, Engels said, well, agreed with this, and therefore everything's right and whatever. But it was just, it was just you know, going through this archival material is actually a really interesting find to see that, you know, even, it's not just, these differences aren't just between the, the, the proletarian women's movement and the bourgeois women's movement, they fed into the ranks and they kind of overlaid the struggle between the left and the right. It's not, that, it's not a kind of one-for-one one copy. They, they, they merge and they get confused, but it was an interesting thing to, uh, um, uh, to find. As I say, uh, Tsekin has a lot to say about the four vets in the coming um, thing. I have a book chapter on, on this whole thing, on the clean break, and I don't want to, you know, again, I don't want to quote Munger as this, like, oh, this, is, the, this is the way, or, but I just, just trying to get... Uh, back uh, into focus what Tekin was saying about these things. Right? She says, our task is not to make the innocuousness of socialism plausible to a few bourgeois women. Our task is to make the mass of proletarian womankind aware of their class position and their suffering as a class, to convince them of the necessity of getting rid of capitalist society, of educating them into a conscious and energetic section of the revolutionary proletariat. Instead of blurring the dividing line between the bourgeois and proletarian women's movement by a tactically clever approach, i.e. by watering down our point of view, we must point out this dividing line uh, more and more clearly by energetically emphasizing the class contradictions involved, as well as our own principles. In both camps, i.e. proletarian uh, women's movement, bourgeois women's movement, there must be clarity about the, the, fact, the fact that the slogan of the one camp is social reform, whereas the war cry of the other is social revolution. And again, that, is, uh, uh, um, th th that lays out, I think, the fundamentals of what she was uh, about. About 10 minutes, is that, yeah, 10 minutes left. Um, so yeah, that's really what I wanted to highlight today, partly because what I want to say at the end, which I say hopefully will kick off some, uh, some discussion. Um, but I do think that for various reasons, this kind of fundamental stuff, <laughs> stuff has been lost. And we have to, I think, understand the success of Tetkin uh, in, in, before 1914, the success of the International Socialist Women's Movement, for all its flaws and problems and shortcomings, we have to understand that success as the product of this basic strategic line that she upheld against, sometimes against the, uh, the, uh, the, the Forwärts, sometimes against uh, women like Emma Ira, who was uh, heavily influenced by, uh, by revisionism and Bernstein, and how that all held uh, together. And I've just got some various pictures here from uh, the, the International Socialist Women's Movement, you can see uh, Tedkin, Colin, Ty, sorry, uh, um, yeah, Tedkin and Colin, Ty up there, I think that was in the 20s, um, and then some of the, the, the women's, uh, working women's organizations, so the, 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 uh, the, text, the textile workers there, uh, and then the, the bottom right picture is the first uh, International uh, Women's Day, which was a product of, uh, of the Second International and the International Socialist Women, as you're probably all aware, right? This was a, a resolution of uh, uh, the Copenhagen Congress of, of, of the International Socialist Women's Movement. Um, and you see uh, some of the things that, that, that it did. Um, so that's the, the basic. I, I, I don't want to go too much into the war, um, but just to make a few points that, as I, as I kind of alluded to before, during uh, the war, during the Burgfrieden, um, this, this newspaper becomes, uh, uh, Die Gleichheit becomes a, a rallying point for international uh, opposition to the war. Um, do you know, I've done this before, but I, maybe if some of you at the meeting that I did last summer, but do you know why there's gaps there? Censorship, yeah. So basically, this was uh, this was basically. Um, I think that's one of the first uh, issues that were produced uh, after the outbreak of war, and I think in the autumn of 1914. Um, and Setkin was you know, basically 
told to you know go and uh, remove certain things. Um, but the, but the struggle continues, and she uses the Die Gleichheit, as I say, as a platform to rally uh, uh, the forces of the uh, of, of the anti-war left, even to the point where, like Marx did with the Weinische Zeitung, where I think they printed it, their stuff. They didn't remove it; they just printed it in red. I think it was, it was, they put the whole thing in red. Uh, you know, they would go with the censor and say, "Second, said I just had enough of doing all these corrections from the from the German uh, state. I'm just going to print it with the gaps in, and you can make what you want of it." I talked about Bern. Uh, the Spartacus League, Liebknecht in Luxembourg, um, and then arrested on a return to Germany for distributing the ban statement. I've got a nice picture from the ISG there at the end. I'll show you uh, about that. And yeah, she was removed um, as, as editor in April 1917, replaced by a, a woman called Maria Juhacz. Um, and really, the, many of the concerns that were raised about Die Gleichheit as not being kind of uh, uh, massenfähig or able to speak to masses of people, uh, they turn out to be wrong because the, 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 the magazine generally goes into decline after, after 1917 to the point where in 1923, uh, against the, the, the backdrop of mass inf uh, uh, inflation, hyperinflation, one, one edition would cost like 40,000 marks or something like that. So it, it wound up in 1924. Um, and... Uh, there's a good PhD thesis for those of you who read German um, uh, by a woman called Miriam Zaxer, uh, who does quite a nice, I, I won't do this in my project, but she does a really good comparison of the content of the pre-1917 Gleichheit and the post-1917 Gleichheit and really about the difference. It was more, the latter was more about then, about the new woman and uh, a, a kind of more individual path to, 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 to liberation and socialization, et cetera, uh, which, which is interesting. I can, I can highly recommend that. But yeah, she becomes a communist MP um, and uh, kind of is one of the few figures in that sense uh, that is both a leading member of the revolutionary social democratic wing of the Second International and the leading member of, uh, of the communists, right? That a lot of people split from social democracy and, and, and join the international communist movement, but she has that continuity as somebody who's been in the movement from the very early days um, and, and, and uh, goes through uh, with the, the KPD. Um, trials and tribulations, this is probably the least research period of her life, for good reason we will come on to. Um, but she continues to organize us de communistin, which was the, uh, the, the women's uh, um, publication of the KPD, uh, the Communist Party of Germany. Uh, and is, is, you know, draws on the connections that she'd established in the Second International within the context of Comintern and the International Communist Women's Movement. Um, I translated the, 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 the guidelines for, uh, for uh, communist work among women, I think is the full title of it, which was uh, presented to the Third Congress of Comintern, uh, also worth, worth a read. And you know, I would say that you can, you can see a basic continuity there in the strategy that I outlined before. Uh, but also maybe some shifts in, 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 in emphasis as, as well. I think there's far more. You may have noticed from some of the material earlier on that the, um, the, the family, th th there's less of an emphasis on the socialization of the family and maybe in, in the earlier stuff, whereas that becomes far more uh, prominent in the, in the communist period. The, the state will play a bigger role, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, that's, that's, a, that's a worthy uh, compare and contrast uh, exercise. The thing about, you could say, with Tsetkin, uh, her fate mirrors that of the communist movement more generally. So as one of kind of the leading figures, there are several junctures and several crisis points at which she uh, feels ultimately angered and betrayed by the actions of the party. And you'll find that in her correspondence. You'll find that sometimes in some of her articles. But really, she is committed fundamentally for right and wrong uh, to the Soviet project. Uh, and I think in that sense, it's, it's, it's partly of her own, uh, it's her own undoing in a sense, right? Um, that, that, that's clearly something that needs to be uh, unpacked critically. Um, because other people, you know, for example, the March action, which I've, I, again, I've written about and, and spoken about, I can li link to you guys. It's a crisis in, in the German KPD, and she is absolutely opposed to these developments, these kind of putschist uh, uh, attempts to take power. Um, but she doesn't leave the KPD. She doesn't leave the Comintern. She sticks with it, and, you know, maybe that, that's the correct thing to do. Probably it was. But the problem is, as, as you go further and further down the road, as the party becomes more and more bureaucratized, as the Comintern itself becomes more and more uh, bureaucratized, her frustration really is only vented 
in the form of private correspondence. So it's very, it's, it's um, again, some feminist writers will say she's just a marionette, a, a puppet of, the, of Bolshevism and the Bolsheviks. And that's, that's actually misleading in a sense because she had her own agenda. She was one of the uh, most experienced people tactically, politically, strategically in the movement um, and had all sorts of fights with Ernst Thälmann, uh, um, Ruth Fisher, uh, Arkady Maslov, all of these people in the party in the various factional disputes. But it's not uh, always entirely clear uh, where she stood, especially as things go on. Um, and a, a, a tragedy of her own making, Setkin and Stalinism. So this is actually a picture from Setkin's uh, funeral. And it's no, I mean, if you read the correspondence, if you read Stalin, if you read Setkin, she had no time for Stalin whatsoever. Right, um, and it, it, again, she, she had she, she had all sorts of illusions. Looking back, it's easy to say she had all sorts of illusions in the Soviet project and what it was doing. But she did not like Stalin, and it was the feeling was mutual. Uh, so this is a, this is a letter from Stalin to I think to Pyatnitsky, I've forgotten now, uh, where he describes the last meeting between Setkin and Lenin, who she obviously adored. Uh, uh, and perhaps even uh, canonized slightly too much later on, but that's a, that's a whole separate issue. And uh, Stalin says, the, the old witch, the alter hexer, kissed, <laughs> kissed Lenin's hands. Can you believe it? And you know, he did not have time uh, uh, for her. Um, and but, and one, of the, one of her biographers that I mentioned earlier on makes the point that Setkin becomes this kind of, uh, right from her death, this is the instrumentalization takes place. So who has to be seen at the front carrying the, the grave? Yeah, uh, um, Stalin, I think that's Molotov actually in, the, in, 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 in position three and the, the middle one is either Hörnler, a German friend of hers, or Peek actually, it could be, but I, I don't wanna uh, uh, say, I'll have to look that up. But right from the, 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 I mean, she's buried in the Kremlin wall, if anyone's ever been there, you can see that she's, she was a hero of the Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. And that becomes more and more the case as she goes on. Uh, sorry, as, as the Soviet Union goes on. We have here as well, um, I don't know if you can read that, but she, she, she has, I've just discovered her correspondence with Trotsky, uh, which I'm gonna dig up next week, so wish me luck with that. Um, but again she, again, she had some issues with Trotsky, to put it mildly. Um, she writes an, uh, one article against the Trotskyist opposition, which is available in English, it was translated by an Indian group, I think, uh, um, and she talks of the traitors or idiots uh, around the, uh, the Trotsky opposition. Um, but who knows what the, the, the correspondence will bring. That will be a fun little thing to do next, to, next week, and I can keep you posted. Fundamentally, she was an ally of Bukharin, so she, she's generally seen as on the right of the communist movement, uh, um, in right maybe also in, in some ways in, in the other term, not just on the right, but actually in many ways was right in a criticism of, of Stalin and Trotsky, to be fair. That's an, that's, again, that's another big issue I don't want to open the can of worms on, but, um, but she, she was yeah, fundamentally a, a part of, of, of that. Uh, movement, um, and I say publicly does uh, not make a st uh, stand, but cor correspondence full of criticisms. Now we come on to the GDR, the bastards. Uh, as a historian, I mean, there's, you know, there's many crimes of Stalinism, right? But for, as, from, from a, the, the perspective of a, of a historian, the work, well, not the worst, the, one of the, the most unforgivable crimes is that, okay, there's a film made about Clara Tsetkin in the GDR. She's kind of put on, again, put on a pedestal, or she's the babushka communisma in Russia, right? The grandmother of communism. Um, but they sit on pretty much the entirety of her stuff, of her materials, right? So now I was just telling comrades before this meeting started, I spent about three days pulling together the entirety of her, of her materials that are available in the GDR archive. It came out only recently, thanks to me and some other, com <laughs> and, and some other comrades, that there was actually a 34 volume collected works edition put together by her son, Maxime, who stayed in the GDR, right? And his wife, who worked closely with Tekin when she was in her final years, a 34 volume collected works, speeches and writings. The GDR produced a three volume Ausgewählt, I don't know if you know that word in, in Dutch. <laughs> the, the, the key word is selected, right? Selected uh, uh, re, uh, speeches and writings in which also we found that there's censorship involved. So for example, when she speaks in 1917 of uh, uh, fraternal war, the possibility of fraternal war, Bruderkrieg between the different socialist parties, that's turned into civil war, <laughs> Bürgerkrieg, 
by the German, uh, uh, the, the GDR uh, editors, right? So little things like this, they sat on it. And if you go to the correspondence, I've, I've quoted some of it now, it's clear that why they did that, right? They wanted to make this woman, uh, they wanted it to place her on a pedestal, but producing the works, producing the correspondence would have actually completely undermined that. We would have seen the stuff about Stalin. We would have seen the stuff about the K KPD and the shit show it was in the 1920s, right? We would have seen the stuff about uh, Ernst Thälmann, uh, the German Stalin, and how much of an idiot he was in, in Setkin's view. Like, literally, so I've got nothing personally, personal against the guy, but he, isn't, he knows nothing. He knows nothing about the basics of Marxism, right? She didn't, didn't mince her words. So yeah, 30 volumes of work and 34 volumes of letters and correspondence, which have just been sat in an archive, uh, which the GDR refused to, uh, to produce. So I'll be going there next week, and, um, and, uh, and yeah, there'll be lots of stuff. Um, Hermann Weber describes her as between critical and bureaucratic communism. Yeah, that, that's, that's a whole, uh, a whole other uh, ball, ball game. Um, now, last two, uh, sorry, I've gone over, gone over slightly, last two slides. Um, you can see here's a picture, very unfocused picture of uh, Tsekian, I'd say, coming back into focus. As I've made clear, she's one of the most uh, controversial, disputed, instrumentalized figures in, in workers' and women's history. But as I've, I've, as I've outlined, fal falsehoods, censorship, and neglect, as I've made clear. Dogmatic anti-feminist communist is one of the, the uh, Florence Hervé's book you'll see. Uh, uh, feminist without borders, Gilbert Bardier, uh, French, French guy who's, uh, the book's all of it, uh, the biography of her in the 90s, also available in German, Feminist sans frontier, it's called. Uh, or Red Feminist is a, uh, 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 I should probably shouldn't say it's a not very good book uh, by Lou Zucker that came out in Germany uh, uh, a year or two ago, which I reviewed uh, uh, for historical materialism. Uh, yeah, not particularly, but you see how these things have happened. Um, so, some ideas for discussion. Uh, my, my basic points today. Without Setkin die Gleichheit, the International Socialist Women and Social Democracy, our world will look different, I think. And this is, this is something that's, that's lost, particularly when it comes to uh, bourgeois academic historiography of, of German history and European history, is that somehow the men, many of the rights that, uh, that women in particular enjoy today is kind of like an organic product of the de development of these societies, right? I think that's, that's completely uh, uh, wrong. Uh, and I think that actually we on the left also make these questions far too difficult for ourselves. We're too apologetic and we tend to... Um, uh, kind of blur some of the, 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 the key political and strategic takeaways that we should be uh, uh, looking to Setkin to, to, to take, not in a kind of uh, instrumental way, but to look by going back to Setkin's work and life as it was, as opposed to how it was subsequently uh, portrayed. We need a, not a hagiography a la the GDR, but a critical appropriation of her, her legacy. We've talked about the Soviet question, the influence of Vassal. I think there was an overestimate, overestim uh, overestimation of the, uh, uh, the, the, the activity of the masses in certain points of, of her way of uh, dealing with the, the problems of the SPD. Uh, Luxembourg, Rosa Luxemburg uh, wrote in a typical uh, Rosa Luxemburg way that uh, Setkin talks a lot and she's quite revolutionary, but she doesn't have an opinion of her own. That's what Setkin, Luxembourg wrote to a friend in the 1890s. That changes, I think, I think uh, Setkin was certainly in, in the 1890s. Uh, there, were, there were aspects of that and she, we saw how she went to Engels. We, she would often also go to Kautsky and say, look, I don't quite trust my judgment here. What do you think, right? So there was, there was that uh, element as well. The document is just I've kind of dealt with. It shows how long I've been around on this, but I remember in 2009, a debate between uh, John Riddell and Lindsay German um, where uh, they talk about Marxism and the women's question. And Riddell, a, a good friend of mine, a good historian, basically makes the point that this is all of its time and it has no relevance today, the strategic approach that I've outlined, right? Because... You know, the, the, the rise of women's rights movement, the, the fact that uh, Marxism and feminism have been kind of at loggerheads, that Marxism underestimated the significance of the women question so-called or allegedly did. I think there's a lot going on here. And I think that hopefully what I've shown and what I, what I wish to show in more detail in, in the coming uh, years of my project is that Marxism actually took the women's question for all its faults very seriously indeed, it actually developed an, uh, its own political and strategic approach, but that has been lost, particularly in the experience of uh, you know, real existing socialism, 
uh, women as kind of funny shaped workers in the Trotskyist movement, you know, all this kind of, no, seriously, I mean, there's definitely, and I think second wave feminism in its way uh, sought to address that head on. It was clearly saying, well, look, Marxism, what have you got to offer us, right, really? Because <laughs> this, this is what's happening. And I think, so there's, we have to kind of strip away the packaging somewhat, but I do, I, I'm kind of the opposite view of Riddell. We need to go back to this stuff critically, but actually recognize the need uh, for uh, a programmatic alternative on all uh, questions. Uh, I raised, uh, some of you may know comrade uh, Mark Fisher, who always spoke, spoke to me of bolt-on Marxism. So you, know, you kind of just stick things on, like a bolt-on would be like a, a phone contract, and you, know, you can bolt on 200 free minutes for a couple of quid. And I think that's generally one of the major flaws of the left on this and other programmatic questions. It'll just stick on, oh, Marxist feminism, taken care of. Re revolutionary feminism, left voice, right? Or uh, eco-socialism matter dealt with, this tokenistic labels as opposed to a programmatic integration. And, and, and you know, that was, for all their faults, and, and, and that was really Setkin's, uh, um, uh, uh, one of Setkin's key contributions to Marxism as a theory, but also Marxism as historical and living uh, moment. Um, yeah, and I think probably I'll stop there. Sorry for going on too long, but um, yeah, I look forward to discussing with you comrades. Thank you.